Today's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. This is the word of God. You know, uh, we're week three, uh, you know, here at uh, Chino, uh, so Church of Southland Chino, we celebrate week three. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of confusing because for some of us it's week four because we kind of had a soft launch. But uh, yeah, praise the Lord, you know, just what, what God is doing and just, you know, um, you know the, the wonderful works that, that he wants to start. So, you know, um, what, what God has placed upon my heart, especially as we're kind of going through these first series of messages was like, um, I remember I was talking to someone and they're like, hey, so what's your church about? You know, like, uh, why, you know, uh, why another church, uh, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, what do you guys stand for? What do you guys believe in? And, you know, uh, if you're a church, you, you kind of agree in kind of the same, like, tenets, you know, kind of like the more primary thing. So every church that calls upon the name of the Lord, we all unite around these common set of truths that actually defines us as a church. But uh, every church kind of has a DNA. Every church kind of has like, you know, they call it a spirituality and a DNA and kind of like an emphasis and a focus. And, you know, uh, I kind of wanted to spend like several of the sermons. I I really don't know how long it's going to go. Like, you know, somebody was like, is this a series? I'm like, I think so, you know. Uh, I think it's a series, you know. Then how come you don't call it a series, you know? Uh, So, you know, um, like, uh, you know, so it's a series, you know. It's a series, you know. (laughs) You know, welcome to our series. (laughs) Um, and, you know, um, I just want to let you know, like, this is what we're about. Like, this is what's important to us. Uh, this is why we exist. And uh, this is what, like, you know, gets me up in the day and makes me want to, like, you know, serve as a pastor of this church is because um, this is what makes me happy. You know? So, uh, you know, what are we about? You know, so if you were here at our launch service, basically I was like, hey, you know, the church, like, you know, we do a lot of things and, you know, a lot of good works, but at the core, we're a spiritual organization. At the core, we're, sp- we're a spiritual institution. And, and the reason why uh, the church of Jesus Christ is the most important organization in the world. Can I get amen on that? Amen. You know, when someone said that to me, I didn't get it. You know, I, I was like, oh, he's only saying that because he's, he's a pastor. You know, it's like, you know, it's saying like, you know, whoever, whatever you're part of, you're like, that's the most important, right? But then, you know, uh, I came to understand it really is important. And the reason why is because when God created us, he created us beautiful, dignified, and worthy. But often, we don't feel that way. We don't feel worthy. We don't feel dignified. This is why we're trying so hard to prove ourselves, right? You know, this is why we're trying so hard in our careers, and our education. We're so trying so hard to kind of like make it in life because like, you know, we don't feel, we don't feel that worth. Like, you know, we have that shame, we cover ourselves, uh, you know, we have that kind of like that brokenness and, you know, we try to cover ourselves with like degrees and our education and, you know, our resources, our personality, our strength. But, you know, the Bible says that you are worthy, you are dignified, you are the most beautiful. But I think the reason why we don't understand that is because we focus on the physical more than the spiritual. You see, God made the spirit that lives inside of you beautiful and worthy and dignified. And when you, you know, uh, when you focus on that, because for often a lot of us, we starve it and we ignore it, it actually affects our physical where like, you know, we express it in shame and covering and all these things, right? So, you know, why does the church exist? The church exists to recapture, reclaim, restore, and re-beautify the beautiful spirit that God has created in you. This is why the church is so important. Amen? It makes sense, right? This, this is why it's important to go to church, right? Because once the spirit becomes beautiful, everything else gets blessed, right? Once the spirit becomes, this is why Paul said to, you know, to women who were like, you know, uh, like, you know um, like so anxious because their husbands didn't love them and, you know, they're trying to like get physically prettier, you know, buy more clothes, you know, like buy more jewelry, put on more makeup. He was like, hey, 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 
Uh, I'm not saying that's not important, but what's more important is if you make the spirit beautiful, then everything else will be, you know, uh, come to peace in your life. And when are you going to, where are you going to hear this? Where, where are you going to hear this at work? You going to hear this at TV? Uh, you know? You going to hear this on social media? No, the only way you hear this is the Church of Jesus Christ. This, this is why church is important. Because you are a spiritual being having an earthly experience more than a physical being having a spiritual experience. Amen? Yeah, and then we forget that. We, we, we forget that, right? And, and, you know, the reason why we forget that is because this thing called sin, right? And, you know, for most of us, we talk about the fruits of sin, right? You know, like sin is like, you know, greed and, and you know, uh, theft and like lust. Like, you know, uh, uh, like sin is like this kind of thing. No, you know, the core and the root of sin is basically you don't think God exists or you, you, you believe God exists, but his will is not that important in your life. Therefore, you're the center rather than God being the center. And when you become the center, you miss the mark. You completely miss out on the life that God has for you. And then you you experience the brokenness of that. You, you know why the world is broken? The world is broken is because so many people live as if they're the center, center of their lives rather than having God as the center of their lives. You know, so this is why, like, you know, um, you know once I, you know, had, you know, I decided God is going to be the center of my life, his will is going to become important to me, like, you know, uh, I experienced, like, like, restoration and freedom and blessing that, you know, I just, you know, I want, I want to share that more and more with you, you know, as we, as we continue on, you know, in our church. Like, you know, uh, God is not someone that I just believe, but he's important to me because he, he's changing my life. You know, like, uh, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm getting old. I don't think I'm old, you know, but like, man, like, older I get, I feel like better my life is becoming. Isn't that beautiful? Right? Yeah. You know, like, uh, I don't regret like, I don't look back at how great my 20s was, you know? I don't regret how great my 30s was. I actually look to the future, you know? Like, I'm like, man, what's my life going to look like in, like, you know, my 50s and 60s and 70s? It's going to be, like, amazing. Praise the Lord. Why is that? It's because now, now I'm hitting the mark, <laughs> you know? Now I'm on the trail. I'm not lost. Now I see, right? And now I have hope. Now I'm excited. All because... I repented from my sin. You guys see that? Yeah, yeah, that's so cool, huh? Yeah. So, uh, what do we want to talk about today? Well, uh, I want to kind of clear up, uh, you know, misunderstanding and a confusion, because um, you know, theologians. Uh, so, I, I want to kind of give like a little bit of a technical word. When you read the Bible, um, theologians talk about the penalty of sin and the power of sin. Okay, the penalty of sin and the power of sin. But, uh, you know, uh, th- uh, this terminology is not in the Bible, okay? Uh, but when you read the Bible carefully, uh, if you don't understand it in terms of this terminology, you're going to get really confused, okay? Uh, because, like, or uh, you're just going to understand it very, like, simply, which is not going to bless your life, okay? So, uh, you know, what do I mean by that, right? Uh, you know, what do I mean by the penalty of sin? So the penalty of sin, according to scripture, is this. We are freed from God's judgment because of our sin, which leads to eternal spiritual death. We are freed from that through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the reason why Jesus came was to deliver us from God's judgment and to free us from the eternal spiritual death that we're going to experience because of that judgment. So because of that, you know, the Bible uses language like we are forgiven, we are accepted, and we are unconditionally loved, and the main character is Jesus, okay? So Jesus is the one who frees us from God's judgment and eternal spiritual death. So that's the penalty of sin. So the summary of, you know, the theologians is basically they're saying that's the penalty of sin, okay? But, uh, you know, what's really interesting is uh, when you read the biblical authors, even though they change topics, they don't let you know they're changing topics. So basically, you know, as they're kind of like, like if they're driving and you're following them, they make a turn, but they don't turn on the blinker. So they make a turn and you just drive straight through and you completely miss them. And so, you know, the biblical authors, you know, uh, they talk about the power of sin now, but often we get confused thinking that as they're talking about the power of sin, 
they're in reality talking about the penalty of sin. So now, uh, what's the power of sin? Well, this is how the biblical authors define it. The power of sin is we are freed from our flesh now to live an abundant life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So the words that the biblical authors use is things like purposeful and effective. And, and this is actually a word that they use a lot, fruitful. You are fruitful. And all because of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, you know, I'm going to give two examples. First, this is if you read the book of Galatians, okay? Galatians is all about freedom. Galatians basically says, you are now free, right? But what's really interesting about Galatians is Paul, you know, he doesn't kind of give the blinkers. The first half of Galatians basically is Paul saying, you are freed from the penalty of sin. And the second half of Galatians, Paul is basically saying, you are freed from the power of sin. The first half of Galatians, Paul is saying, you are freed from the penalty of sin through the work of Jesus. The second half of Galatians, you are freed from the power of sin through the work of the Holy Spirit. You guys, you guys kind of see that? So, you know, um, uh, I encourage you to read Galatians this week and kind of see what I'm talking about, right? But Paul doesn't say this, but what Paul says, which confuses the reader, is he basically just says, you're free, you're literally just free. So it's like, you know, chapter one, freedom, chapter two, freedom, chapter three, freedom, four, freedom, five. So you just think, oh, I'm free. So we just think we're free in one way. But what Paul's talking about is, no, you're free in one way, and then you're free in another way. So let me kind of take you to a text now in Romans chapter six. So in Romans chapter six, Paul says, you are freed from the penalty of sin. Okay, this is what he says. So he says, for the death that he died, this is talking about Jesus, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So if I could summarize this, Paul's basically saying Jesus died, and when Jesus died, through your faith in him, sin died in your life. So believe that sin died in your life. Can I get an amen on that? Isn't that great news? Right? So brothers and sisters, let me say this. If you believe in Jesus, sin is now dead in your life. Amen? Right? Okay. So uh, now Paul's going to go on in verse 11, okay? Uh, in verse 12. But he doesn't give a blinker. Okay? So a careful Bible reader would actually be very confused by this. Because he says now, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. For sin shall not, be your mas shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Wait a minute. I thought sin was dead. You guys see that? Wait, isn't sin dead? Why does Paul say, don't let sin live? Sin's dead. Very next verse, brothers and sisters. Paul's like, verse 11, sin's dead. Verse 12, kill sin. Weird, right? <laughs> Some of you guys are like, no, no I, just, I just believe whatever you tell me. <laughs> you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord, right? You know, you tell me, I believe. Just, you know, recite Bible, I believe. Praise the Lord. Heart of a child, right? You know, uh, I remember I tried to talk some theology to my kids, and one of my kids was like, just tell me what you believe. <laughs> That's a good, uh, you know, a, a good thing, okay. But, you know, uh, verse 12, right? Uh, right? Uh, you're dead to sin, but not kill sin. So, you know, Paul literally in four verses basically says, you're dead to sin, but don't make sin your master. Now, what's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about the division between the penalty of sin and the power of sin. He's basically saying, you're freed from the penalty of sin, but you got to also defeat the power of sin. Right? And, and, and when a Christian doesn't have this worldview, right? Because, you know, it's all about worldview, right? Worldview is why you make decisions. Worldview is the quality of life you have. Worldview is what forms and shapes your character. If you don't have this worldview, your, your life's going to be really messed up, you know, because you don't understand what the scriptures are saying. So, uh, you know, Paul's basically like, you're dead to sin, but you can't let sin be your master. Now, uh, so what do we say here at the Church of Southland? 
right? What do we say here at the Church of Southland? You know what, you know what we say here, and you know what Pastor Keith, our senior pastor, has been saying for the past 20-something years? He's basically saying there's a lot of people who are freed from the penalty of sin that are still living under the power of sin. And because of that, their life is a mess. And they're not experiencing the incredible blessings that God, their Father, wants to graciously give to them. Right? Uh, I remember, you know, last week I said, Pastor Keith said this. I was wrong. He didn't say that. He actually got it from someone. Yeah. So D.L. Moody said this. You know, um, you know, D.L. Moody said, some of us, we believe just enough to be miserable. Right? You know what that means? We believe in God. His will is not important in our lives. You know, um, when my daughter was little, I think she was like in third or fourth grade, uh, and my wife wasn't there. It was just me and her, and she just started crying. She's like, you know, I'm like, why are you crying? You know, why are you crying? There's a difference between mom and dad. Dad's like, why are you crying? Mom's like, oh, come here, you know? And then, you know, I was like, why are you crying? And then she's like, dad, I'm so stressed. And, you know, like, I'm so stressed. And I was like, why are you so stressed? You're fourth grade, third grade, fourth grade, right? Life should be good. And then she's like, you know, I'm so stressed. And I was like, shoot, like, is it grades? Like, I don't know, right? You know, you know, I don't know what it's to be a woman. I don't know, right? And then, you know, she's like, she's like, I'm so stressed because I have too many friends. I was like, say that again. She goes, I'm so stressed. And then she was like, this person want to be my best friend. This person want to be my best friend. This person want to be my best friend. This person want to be my, and she's like, I just don't know. I can't handle it. And then I was like, that's a problem? And then, you know, she was like, you know, I don't know what to do. And I was like, simple. Just pick one best friend and tell everybody you're not their best friend. (laughs) And then, you know, she stopped talking to me. (laughs) (laughs) And she was just miserable. Because she's just being pulled in constant directions, right? She's constantly pulled, right? And she just couldn't deal with it anymore. And that's someone that's, pulled by the power of sin that has security under the penalty of sin, right? So uh, that's a problem. You know why that's a problem? Is because the Bible actually calls this a wasted life. You know that, brothers and sisters? There's a Bible verse that it gets me. I actually think about it a lot. And... Uh, you know, um, it's 1 Corinthians 3. And it says, Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. So uh, basically what, what this verse is saying is, you know, the day is the day of the Lord when, when Jesus returns. And this is a person that's not lazy. You know, this is, not, this is a person that's not doing anything, but this is a person that's working. Like, you know, like, it has, this, this guy has dreams and desires and goals and, and purpose and meaning, right? But it's not for God. So when the day comes, uh, you know, there's a symbolic language called fire. The, the, the fire is going to go over everything. And, and basically the fire examines and purifies. Like, you know, it, it like purifies to see, like, is it worthy, is it worthy, is it worthy? So it says the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And, and verse 14 says, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved as yet through fire. You know what this Bible verse is saying, brothers and sisters? It's saying like one day we're going to stand before God and he's just going to go over everything that we did. And there's this possibility that nothing's going to survive. Right? Like, like the fire is going to go through everything, how we raise our kids, how we conducted our marriage, how we like, you know, served that church, how we you know, conducted our businesses, how we conducted our relationships. It's going to go through, the fire is going to go through everything, and, and, and Paul is giving us the possibility that everything that we did could possibly be burned up. And, and we suffer loss, but this person is saved. This person is a Christian. 
This person's actually going to go to heaven. But everything else will be burned out. This is basically, Paul's talking about a wasted life. And here's the question. Why is this a wasted life? Like, like what, what happened? And, and, you know, basically the biblical writers, they're saying, the reason why this is a wasted life is because this person understood the freedom that comes from the penalty of sin, but this person never experienced the freedom that comes from the power of sin. And, and you know, so, so what is our church about? What is our church about? Like, you know, why, why, why are we here? Why, you know, why did we uproot like 200 people and, 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 and come to the Inland Empire? Like, like, why do we do that? The reason why we do that is because our church, we have a passion not just to give eternal life, but we want all of God's children to receive an abundant life through the breaking of the power of sin in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? This is why we exist. And, and, and this is what drives the worldview of our leaders. This is what I pray about. I, I pray that people come to know Jesus and, and be saved, that, that you know, the spiritual judgment and condemnation will be removed through the blood of Jesus Christ. But I also pray that the power of sin that tempts us and leads us astray and messes up our lives will be removed in the power of the Holy Spirit. So everything that we do, all the organization, all the structures, all the prayers that we set up is so that the penalty of sin will be removed and the power of sin will be removed in Jesus' name, right? So, 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 so this is why we do it. So brothers and sisters, uh, how do we overcome the power of sin, right? Because you know how you overcome the penalty of sin? By faith in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Faith, grace through faith. You just have to receive and believe. It is not by work so that no one can boast. But how do we overcome the power of sin? Well, let me start here. You overcome the power of sin through the spiritual disciplines. Overcome the power of sin through the spiritual. Let me say this. Not all disciplined people are godly, but all godly people are disciplined. Okay? Not all disciplined people are godly, but all godly people are disciplined. Uh, I shared this in the first service last week, but I didn't get a chance to share this in uh, the second service, but I think this is very relevant. The original sin, right? You know, the first sin, the first sin of Adam and Eve. Okay, so here's the context. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Okay, so this is the first sin. Now, notice something here. Okay, um, you know, if you, if you guys grew up in a church and you went to Sunday school um, you know, uh, one of the reasons why we're not good Bible readers is because kind of like weird and shocking things are no longer weird and shocking to us, you know, because we're so inundated by it. But if you're reading the Bible for the first time and you read something like this, you're just like, this is really weird and shocking, okay? So brothers and sisters, let me ask you, what is weird and shocking about this? Who's talking? The serpent, right? Isn't that weird? You're like, no, no, no. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Serpent's talking, guys. And, and later on, the, 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 you know, the, the understanding seemed to be he was actually walking. Right? Because, you know, the curse, he says, you will not walk anymore, but you will crawl, crawl on the ground, which means that maybe he walked. So think about it, okay? The first sin, serpent is walking, the serpent is talking. The serpent is very intelligent. The serpent is very rational, right? The serpent is very resourceful. And the serpent knows how to speak in a language where Adam and Eve understand. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> you know, I feel like a lawyer right now. Is that not weird? <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that not weird? It's weird, right? The biblical authors wrote this story in to prove a point because the serpent is a beast. The serpent is an animal. But the serpent does everything else Adam and Eve does, right? Adam and Eve walks. Adam and Eve talks. Adam and Eve is intelligent. Adam and Eve is resourceful. Adam and Eve is relational. And Adam and Eve speaks a language. 
So basically, Moses, who I believe wrote the book of Genesis, basically says this beast is exactly like this human that's made in the image of God. Yet, this beast is the furthest thing away from the image of God. You guys see that? So what's the difference? What's the difference? What makes a beast... That's that where the image of God has been completely marred and destroyed to the point of irreparable harm versus someone that is created in the image of God. What's the difference? Brothers and sisters, what's the one difference between an animal and a human? You know, I have a dog. Worst dog in the world. That dog only survives because my daughters love that dog. Every time I look at that dog, I experience the gospel all over and over again. <laughs> the wrath of, wrath of me, yet the grace, you know, they, my daughters intercede, and I, so I let them live. <laughs> right? You know why I dislike him so much? The dog has no self-control. Literally, no, the dog just wants, wants to do what the dog wants to do constantly always acting on its desires never able to say no never able to say it's enough never able to act on limits always living a life of pure and complete indulgence sounds like some humans to me you know what the bible's saying i'm not saying it bible's saying it don't shoot the messenger okay Bible saying you're a beast. You're no worse than an animal because you have no self-control. Because there hasn't been a time in your life where for the longest time you can remember where you went against your desires. You actually said no. Brothers and sisters, that's spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline is what makes us human. You guys see that? It makes us human made in the image of God, right? Why do you not want to forgive? Why do you not want to forgive? Because you don't want to, right? At the end of the day, that's what it comes down. You don't want to. Right? Makes us a beast. Animal. That's the difference. Right? Uh, you know, um, I like Christian history. Um, that's one of my hobbies. I like reading about Christian history. Um, you know, people are like, what's your hobbies? I like reading about Christian history. <laughs> That's where conversation dies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know when, I, I've had so many people say, oh. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm on a plane. Hey, what do you do, Pastor? Oh. <laughs> you know, so um, Christian history is really fun, guys. You guys should read it. You know, uh, if you need some authors, let me know. It's beautiful. So Christian history um, from the time Jesus was born for 300 years, okay, until AD 312, for 300 years, generally, historians have called these 300 years um, the era of the martyrs, okay? So for 300 years, they called it the era of the martyrs. And, and, and the reason why was because there's so much persecution, so if you are a Christian, chances are very high you got persecuted, okay? So if you live between AD 0 and AD 312, you most likely was very familiar with persecution. So, you know, uh, when famines, natural disaster, fires happen, uh, Christians were like, you know, uh, you know, they were the first to be blamed. Uh, businesses were affected. So, you know, uh, basically there, there are stories where like there's a Christian business and there's a pagan business, right? And, you know, people would choose the pagan business over the Christian business, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, or, you know, when you were an employee, they wouldn't hire you because you're a Christian, right? Uh, you know, so uh, you were financially affected. Uh, you were physically affected. Uh, there were, in some places in the Roman Empire, there was no police protection. So when someone came and committed a crime, the police would come and be like, oh, oh, he's Christian, forget it. And they'll just walk away. 
So some Christians, because there were some seasons where, you know, demonic, you know, a stronghold happened, like the uh, people would get riled up and they get so angry and they didn't know who to take it out on. They would take it out on the Christians. So, you know, some of these Christians, they had their homes burned, businesses destroyed. Some of these people were thrown in jail. And and the Bible clearly says that some of these people died. So for 300 years, if you are a Christian, this is the type of life you are living in. Okay? And, and, you know... uh, And if you're a Christian during this time, you never struggled with the power of sin. You just didn't struggle with it. You know why? Because brothers and sisters, who wants to be a Christian? During this time, who wants to be a Christian? Right? You had to really believe to be a Christian. In fact, no one accepted you except the church. They wanted to come to church because that was the only place where they got to experience spiritual community. You know why? Because even their families disowned them. So they were looking forward to church. In fact, they wanted to go to church every single day because that was the only place where they experienced, you know, uh, restoration and acceptance and love and freedom. That was the only place where they were not persecuted, looked down on, and considered to be a minority community. So, you know, and, and that was all because of the era of persecution. They called it the era of martyrs. And, you know, uh, this is a little side note, but, you know, uh, we don't live in that type of era right now. But one thing I I always pray, like I always regularly pray is I say, God, give me the faith of those who are persecuted around the world. Amen? Help me to have that type of faith. Help me to have that type of faith because I just, like, you know, um, I don't want my faith to be so comfortable. Help me to have that type of faith. But at uh, AD 312, something changed. Uh, The era of the martyrs actually changed to the era of monks. And all happened because of this guy named Constantine, which is a Roman emperor. So, you know, uh, Constantine was the first Roman emperor that changed religions. So before that, uh, they were all like pagans. So basically, pagan just means like they, didn't, they, they believed in a whole bunch of gods or they believed they were God, you know. And Constantine, he became Christian. And, you know, people are, like, fascinated, and they're like, how did he become a Christian? Two main reasons. Number one was this. His mom, Helena, was a Christian. His mom was a Christian. The gospel was, like, penetrating even into the, uh, you know, the leadership. And we don't know how she became a Christian, but she became a Christian. And history says that she was a strong Christian. And most likely, she was praying powerful prayers over her son, Constantine. Brothers and sisters, this is the power of a mother's prayer, right? You know, um, uh, before, I used to say, I am so thankful that I have one person in my life, rain or shine, who always prays for me every day without fail. And then I would look at my wife. I thought, you better pray for me now to say that, right? Right? And then my mom had a spiritual resurgence. My mom lived the most colorful life on earth. If I told her, told you guys her story, it would be like a movie. This is why I'm so boring, because I saw her life. And then God changed her life, and she became this like incredible Christian. And all of a sudden, every morning she would wake up and start praying for me every single day. Like, every single day. Like, she doesn't call me. She calls my wife. She goes, what does Richard need prayer for? And Christina sends her a list, and she prays. And ever since my mom started to pray for me, I've experienced miracles and breakthroughs like I've never experienced before. That's the power of a mother's prayer. Right? And so Helena was praying for Constantine. Right? And so God started to move. So Constantine was in a war, and he was really scared because he thought he was going to lose. And that night, he had a dream where God came to him, and he had a vision of a flaming red cross. And he knew right away because his mom was Christian. So he made a vow, and he says, if you give me this victory, I will become Christian. Guess what? They got the victory. So he changed his religion, right? He became a Christian. And he announced to the Roman Empire that Christianity is now legal, acceptable, and it's actually good because now he became a Christian. You know what happened? Praise the Lord, right? That's a good thing. But when the 
era of the martyrs ended after Constantine became a Christian, guess what? Every pagan switched their religion. Right? They're like, oh, Constantine Christian? I'm Christian too. Right? So they all change, and the entire world that persecuted the church now came into the world. And it corrupted the church. It made the, the church worldly. So all of a sudden, the, the church started to struggle with gluttony and lust and greed and sloth and pride. Like it literally, it all came into the church, which actually frustrated and, and put into their, uh, the souls of the Christians turmoil. And so because of that, many Christians, because they were so spiritually frustrated, said, we can't stay in the church. We have to find freedom. And to find freedom, they moved out into the desert. And that's how the monastery started. And that's how the era of the monks started. To find freedom. And the main verse that they used to find freedom was 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where, you know, let me read this for us. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone competes in the games, exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. These Christians that were so sick of the world. They were being inundated by the power of sin, although they were delivered from the penalty of sin. Basically said, I'm losing this race. That's basically what they're saying. I have a race and I'm losing. They're, they're, they're basically like, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to finish this race. So, I'm, so for me to finish this race, I need self-control. I need to discipline my body. I need to make it my slave so that I would not be disqualified from what? Not salvation, brothers and sisters, not salvation, but from rewards. You guys see that there? Rewards. Rewards. Not salvation, rewards. So the era of the martyrs changed to the era of the monks. And since 312 AD, honestly, till now, little smattering of persecution here and there, generally the Christian church has been living in the era of the monks. So let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. What kind of era do you think we're living in right now? Are you being persecuted? Or is the world coming into the church? Is the world coming into your life? Is the power of sin being defeated and purified through the persecution of the outside world? Or is the power of sin being enhanced and strengthened and tempted because the world is now coming into the church in our life. What do we need to defeat the power of sin? You need discipline, spiritual discipline. But this is where we get it all confused. This is where like, we, just, uh, we, don't under, we don't define it the way God wants us to define it. So uh, when I say spiritual disciplines, brothers and sisters, um, it's not what I think some of us are thinking about. Okay, so let me kind of explain. Spiritual discipline is not, okay, now I have to make a plan and I have to work hard through sweat and toil to achieve it. Okay, because I know some of you guys are sitting there and you're like, shoot, I need to be more disciplined. Man, you know, my life is too comfortable. Man, you know, uh, I'm a beast, I'm a beast, you know? Like, you know, you know some of you guys are like, man, you know, like, uh, I, I, I really need to shape, you know, like, I need to do quiet time for the next 20 days, right? Uh, you know, I need to do a 30-day challenge. Brothers and sisters, if you're thinking like that right now, let me just say this, you're going to fail. Okay? Uh, this is why we get jaded. This, this is why we get jaded. Like, how many times, brothers and sisters, have you decided to go on a diet, you went on a di diet, three months later, you're back to the same weight or over than the diet that you started, right? How many times have you decided to go to the gym, you went to the gym for like three months, six months, one year, some of you guys for five years, and then five years later, you're back to where you started? I guess no one, <laughs> right? You know? Like, like, how many? This is why we get jaded. And once you fail, you don't want to do it again. 
This is why we don't want to do spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines is not a workout program. It's not a dieting program. There were times when I was young, I was so sick of sin. I was so sick of sin. I was so inspired at a retreat. I made a vow. I made a plan. I got accountability, and I decided to work hard, and I decided to sacrifice sweat and toil to do what I believe God wanted me to do, and I never made it. I never made it. So brothers and sisters, what is spiritual disciplines? What am I talking about? See, everything I'm laying out is a good thing, but we've missed the ultimate goal. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. The goal of spiritual discipline is not to make a plan, is not to work hard, ultimately, is not to sweat and toil, but the goal of spiritual discipline, brothers and sisters, is to hear the voice of God. Can I get amen on that? It's to hear the voice of God. Why? Because let me say this, our God is a speaking God. Our God speaks to all of us. He wants to speak to us. And, you know, some evangelical churches, because they've missed their way, believe that after Jesus Christ died on the cross and he resurrected and he went into heaven, Jesus gave us the Bible. And so our job now is to read the Bible and study it so we can get wise on it, so we can make good biblical decisions because God doesn't speak to us because God is far away. So he gave us the Bible to figure things out until Jesus returns. That is not what the Bible is talking about. That is not what the Bible is talking about. Our God is not a deist God where he saved us and he told us to figure things out until he returns. No, our God is a God who saved us, gave the Holy Spirit who is God to us, who lives inside of us, and who constantly communicates the thoughts of God inside of us to us. Can I get amen on that, brothers and sisters? Right? This is what the goal of the spiritual disciplines is. Why? Because God knows that we live in a broken world and God knows where all the landmines that could destroy our lives are at, and God wants to speak to us so we avoid all these landmines, and God knows all the blessings that he has inserted into this world, and he wants to speak to us so that we don't lose out on any one of these blessings. We miss out on all the landmines so that we may live a fruitful and abundant life to the glory of God. Right? Here's the problem, though. Flesh is loud. Flesh is loud. Flesh is distracting. Right? You know why it's so hard to hear God? Because we're distracted, we're obsessed, we're entertained, we have too much worry, we have too much anxiety, we have too much fear, we have too much obsession, we have too much focus in anything but the voice of God. So the voice of God is quiet, the world is loud, and the goal of spiritual discipline is to quiet all that so that you could hear the voice of God. That's the goal of spiritual discipline. Brothers and sisters, you know the most important thing you need to do in your quiet time? Is not study the Bible. Is not read it and meditate on it. Those are all important. It's not to pray, God bless this, God bless that, although important. The goal of your quiet time is to quiet your flesh. All the worry, all the stress, all the anxiety, all the fear, all the distractions, all the obsessions, all the things that are leading your heart astray, all the temptations that are competing for your attention, you quiet all that. You say quiet in the name of Jesus. You, 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 you submit all that so that you could hear the voice of God and that you could submit to the voice of God. Amen? And when you finally hear the voice of God and God directs you and guides you when you obey immediately and the fruits of that is the abundant life and the breaking of the power of sin that God wants to give you through his Holy Spirit. Most people, too much worry, too much anxiety, too much fear, too much distraction, too much obsession, too much temptation, too many of this, too many of that, so we don't hear the voice of God and so we miss our mark. And we experience the fruits of that. Yeah. So you know why we're here? We're here to help you to hear the voice of God. 
you know, somebody was like, you know, uh, why, does, why does Southland do so many things? Right? Why do we have cell? Why do we have Friday night prayer? Why do we have Sunday worship? Right? My old church, we just went on Sunday worship and that was it. Well, you, you, you know why we do that is because we don't want you to just be delivered from the penalty of sin. We want you to be delivered from the power of sin. Why? Because all these things, we believe, helps you to calm the flesh so you could hear the voice of God so that you can live an abundant life here on earth. Make sense? Yeah. And if you want to hear the voice of God, and I'm going to talk more about that in technical terms. What is it? How do you do it? You know, we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, um, you're at the right place because we care that you have eternal life, but we also care that you have an abundant life. Okay? So, um, you know, that's my prayer for you. So I remember, um, I used to, you know, when I was younger, I used to give a one-year challenge to my church. And I said, hey, you know, for one year, if you do, you know, everything the church offers, I guarantee you your life will change. I was wrong. I was wrong. Somebody, I, I, I think I vaguely remember somebody saying, hey, I did everything you told me and my life hasn't changed. I said, oh, shoot. Like, you know, he wanted, like, I don't know, money back or something, you know? And then it dawned on me, you're right. It's not you do everything. But I give you a new one-year challenge, okay? You know, uh, do everything our church offers so that you could hear the voice of God. And when you hear the voice of God and you submit to it and you surrender to it, even though it's inconvenient and uncomfortable, honestly, I'd rather sweat and toil than be uncomfortable. And when you surrender to it, then your life will change. Make sense? Yeah? So that's why we're here. And if you want to join us in this mission to reach the Inland Empire and beyond, this is why I believe God sent us. Okay? Let's pray.